Schools. Thank you for joining my channel. This is a special event for COCOVID. So hello everyone out there. I am with Sarah Walsh, who some of you may know as Sarah Norland Park on Facebook or her um, persona on Instagram, founding.mother, um, with her fantastic events there. So we are so excited to be here because we were going to talk about this whole idea of making replicas of museum favorites, things we fall in love with in museums. We were gonna do this at Costume College, and we were so excited, and then absolutely gutted when Costume College was canceled due to COVID-19 and all of the lockdown and everything. And we've been sitting at home for months and now we get to connect virtually with you in a way that um, kind of brings our story to you in a way that you can share your stories with us, hopefully. We did try to do this live on Friday and anyone who came along to that witnessed the spectacular audio failure and nearly got to see me cry. But here we are, we have stepped back, rethought and revamped, and here we are um, uh, as good as live, hopefully. We are going to do this as a premiere so that you can chat with us in real time and we can actually spot your questions more easily <laughs> and hopefully you know, in, engage with you there. So, um, Sarah, hi, um, good to see you. <laughs> and um, I think we're just gonna kick off and just tell a little bit about ourselves. So if you'd like to go ahead and tell us sort of who you are and what you do and yeah. Sure, I'm Sarah Walsh. I am a school librarian. Um, librarianship is sort of my vocation. Um, but sewing has been a hobby, a pursuit, a love since I was about 10 years old. Um, my mom taught me to sew on a machine quite similar to that one. Cool. See it in the picture? Yeah, cool. There it is. There it is. It's a featherweight. Yes, it's a yeah, singer featherweight. It was it it was my grandmother's. And I I I love that machine. Um and but I was mostly sewing modern clothing, costumes, things like that. It wasn't until 2016 that I really got into historical costuming, particularly for the persona of Abigail Adams, which is my historical interpretation pursuit. And the hand sewing techniques, the historical dressmaking techniques, I'm still very much learning and becoming more proficient in those. Um, and yeah, it, it sort of blossomed into a whole, <laughs> a whole other, <laughs> whole other focus in my life. Well, Abigail's wardrobe as it grows is amazing. Absolutely beautiful. Um, she's got her own wardrobe <laughs> that you work on. <laughs> I am working on it. Yes, there's, there's a couple of sort of key pieces that I've already made and I'm, you know, adding trims and adding um, accessories and, you know, learning as I go. Um, and it's been, it's been quite the journey. <laughs> Okay, great. Now, I'll just give you a little spoiler alert, everyone, that this fantastic dress right behind Sarah, which is actually the topic of, you know, her, her contribution really um, to this um, presentation, but that's not one of Abigail's. Abigail doesn't wear that it's dress. It's not. It's, no. it's more of a sort of fancy, over-the-top yeah. statement piece. That yeah. she probably would not have worn. No, no. <laughs> Do you want us to give a, give us a quick word about your new venture that blossomed during lockdown? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. So um, when schools closed and there were teachers across the country scrambling for virtual learning content um, that they needed to deliver mm. um, as an as an interpreter, as a historical reenactor and interpreter, I thought it would be a great way to kind of bridge my two careers, my two vocations, if you will, and start offering live interpretive content 
that could be interactive, that could be dynamic, that could be engaging. And I started just kind of asking my friends who do, you know, interpreting and reenacting, would you like to kind of get in on this? And a couple people said, yes, please, I would love to, you know, where can we do it? How can we do it? And I reached out to a number of Facebook groups offering this as sort of a, an answer to lockdown. And because events were being canceled, museums oh. were being closed, there was, no, there was no outlet for the interpretive, interactive reaching out to the public. So a lot of people were very enthusiastic about the idea. And it wasn't until I reached out to a, a, a unit that happened to be, I think, in, in France, a gal named Poppy Mercier, who's a reenactor, World War II WAC um, interpreter, helped me launch Living History Live, which is a Facebook page that hosts three or more live interactive Q&A presentation type talks every week. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. When you, it just when completely you... blew up. <laughs> and it's all periods. It's, I think it's pretty even split between men and women yeah. and um, all inclusive. Uh, it's, it's people of all walks of life interpreting people from history, kind of forgotten voices, people with a lot of, you know, ordinary everyday people that most of us have never heard about, never, yeah. never, and hearing their experiences. And some of, some of the first person interpretation yes. is so immersive and so powerful. Um, anyway, I just, yeah, so little, <laughs> yeah, <you. laughs> this is, yeah, so this is your little promotional bit for live, uh, with Living History Live on Thank Facebook. you for the plug. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's something that will be um, referenced in the video descriptions that people can go check that out because it's really exciting and really cool. So today we are actually talking about our historical sewing projects um, where we have some dream idea. I mean, I, I think that is a common theme. It keeps popping up all through COVID is um, dream gowns, worth gowns. You know, it's not just Kathy Hay and her peacock dress, but it's her panel, the other, well, her, her um, talk with uh, Bernadette on Friday on Bernadette's channel, which by the way, is only up for a week. So if you want to catch that, you need to do it this week before next weekend. But Kathy, you know, they, they were talking about everyone's got a favorite worth gown and they were actually encouraging people to look through all of these examples and pick find one. the one that you fall in love pick with. Pick the one. It's like pages, I was like screens after screens with, you know, it's like each one numbered. I pick number six or, you know, it's like, it was amazing. Um, and such variety over all the decades that the House of Worth uh, made these incredible gowns. I think whatever your era, what, you know, if you see some image, whether it's artwork or um, engravings that are, go back much older before a lot of portraiture, there's, we all have some, some, some little piece of inspiration. What we're talking about today kind of focuses on extants, surviving original garments from the period that we have, you know, that particularly attracts us. Um, so we're not talking about taking inspiration from art because that involves a lot of interpretive processes uh, without reference, without much reference to external sources that you can go look at. It really is another, another um, uh, topic. And I believe someone here. At there, is Bed, there, there's, there's it. Cocoa, there's a Coco Vid video. There's a Coco, there's Coco, a Coco Vid. <laughs> talk about that. And I'm trying to remember who sings it. I, he's doing, I will, I will. I'll try historical bell was it there's that project the two ladies who sent each other yes pictures to to interpret but there is also and we will edit this down so that you don't have my fine digging for it but somebody because i think i highlighted it to try to go back and catch it somebody somebody yesterday was there something in the middle of the night that I couldn't make? I will try to find that. There's somebody. We can link it too. 
<laughs> yeah, what I'll do, I basically, it's there on CocoVid. I will put here somewhere what it is and a link to it <laughs> so you can find it afterwards because at the moment, I don't remember what it's called. Anyway, right. Okay, so each of us with, we are in the same rooms in our homes with the result of our projects. <laughs> As it happens, because Sarah and I met through a shared interest in 18th century costuming and happened to be doing replicas of 18th century gowns, but specifically, specifically 1785. 1785, yes, both gowns. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, there's a coincidence for you. Um, but the things that we, our, our experiences with our projects were so different from each other that we were very fascinated with what each other had done. And then we realized, you know, this is something about basic decision making and certain approaches, different approaches to doing something like this, that it's um, it's basically it's so many permutations. There's so many different ways and all of them can be successful. I think that's what gave um, birth to this idea of joint, joining together to give a talk like this is the idea that from the really basic principles that the lessons we learned in some cases the hard way um that we could encourage you out there everyone else is that if there's something that's really just tugging at your heart and you really really want to have a go at this even no matter what your skill level because you'll get there one day and at some point you just dive in but we thought we'll just talk about one of the key some of the key aspects that we lessons that we learned so that you can go away and be thinking about, you know, what can you do to make your dream happen? Um, what, what, how can it be real? So, Sarah, the first thing that I want to say too is it took it took working myself up to even contact you to say, <laughs> would you be willing to have me kind of, you know, combine our two stories about these gowns into this present into the costume college presentation into this presentation because yours was very high profile <laughs> it was it was and that was that was something i didn't really quite appreciate i mean i knew i had some remarkable people on board that yes. you know people that are you know in in costuming communities they are influencers and very well known i knew that but i didn't really appreciate the impact they would have on the not the success of the project because to be honest all of us could have got together and made this right what i didn't what i didn't appreciate was the impact afterwards you know the 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 interest that there was and then the several months later when the pattern came out and then the mini documentary came out just how much interest that 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 would already be tapped into but that would generate further and that's been incredibly it's just it's just it's it's humbling and gratifying and just oh, you know and but also it's um it's kind of a con confirming sort of process you realize you know yeah. this was this this dress means you know the object of my project just means a lot to a lot of people um and has a universal appeal it seems and your dress is so classic too anyway <laughs> just, but it was it was just little old me <laughs> yeah but just for the sake for the sake of possibly reframing this when i yeah. for the video I just like to say on the back of that, that all of this, every single step getting started, wherever you are in the project and whatever your long tail is, you know, the, the, the opportunities that you want to pursue after your dress has been made or your garment, your sweater that's, uh, you know, a, an embroidered suit or whatever it is, every single thing you think of and you think, oh, that would be a dream to make it happen. It's going to take courage and you will have to psych yourself up and you will have to confront things like feeling you're a nobody, feeling your skills aren't good enough, feel like nobody is interested or imposter syndrome and who am I to talk to them? And all of those things, <laughs> those barriers are in your head. And if that is one message that I think we both can absolutely hand on heart 100% with no qualifications say is the barriers are in your own head. The battle is a mental one. Truth. <laughs> and that, yeah, and that all the other things you can think of that are keeping you from doing this, whether it's time, money, skills, connections, 
access to certain resources, stuff like that, those can all one way or another be overcome or got around. But this only you can work on. And, and, and to be honest, once you take that first step, the rest, it, the ball starts rolling. And you and, and each, each small win, each small success, or each you know, positive response you get when you reach out to something just encourages you. And eventually, yeah, project kind of takes on a life of its own. But let's start at the beginning. <laughs> Sarah, tell me why, why this dress, for you, this dress. Was it's there a purple. It's, <laughs> it's purple. I people who who know me really, really well know that purple is a way of life for me. Um, I I love purple. I I just love it. And you know, it's it's almost like Zach Pinson levels of I do it because I love purple. I don't care what's on trend, I don't care whether it's in or it's out, when you know what was it vibrant orchid was the pantone color of the year i was like yes i'm 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 trendy again okay um, i say i'm here for it <laughs> i mean i do it i wear purple all the time my car is purple everything around me it's funny because in my historical sewing i don't use a lot of purple but my modern life is completely 100 percent unabashedly purple and this gorgeous gown was staring up at me from the book fashioning fashion from a LACMA exhibit which i think was up uh, around like 2011 2012 something like that and it's just this gorgeous vibrant beautiful you know i can't even it's, it's just a gorgeous gorgeous gown the pictures of it are beautiful and you know, it just, it grabbed my attention. Yeah. And back then I never, you know, would have thought, gosh, I got to make that. It was just, I love looking at it. I, you know, it's beautiful. It's purple. It's, you know, I mean, it's, it's an, it's an, it's a statement piece, right? Yeah. And it was, it was interesting to me to see such vibrancy and such use of that really, you know, very, um, opulent color and all this fabric and everything in an 18th century gown because at the time my sense of 18th century clothing was very you know it was rudimentary it was you know I thought of you know dark colored gowns and mm. sort of you know stayed more kind of um colonial simplicity you know my my sense of all of this was very very uh uh elementary at the time so I was you know wow this is incredible it is French. So, you know, it's on the, it's on the avant-garde of, of fashion and it's very, um, you know, um, it, it's big, right? It's making yeah. a big statement. Um, but anyway, so yes, that was the hook. That was okay. it. And, yeah. and, you know, and that's totally okay. If you love a gown because of its intricacy or you love an outfit because of its, you know, um, its trim or because of, you know, it's purple. <laughs> that was it. That was it. That's your thing. That made it your thing. <laughs> you know what? It's not that dissimilar with me and Isabella McTavish Fraser gown. It was, I was interested in 18th century and had, you know, thought that I knew quite a lot about the general color scheme of clothing and stuff like that. But this was tartan, red tartan, not just any tartan, but red tartan and red and tartan. It's like deliberately not wearing those things today because, I mean, that's that's my thing is red tartan and to discover this dress um is the lone survivor is like the it was it was like the more i found out about it having seen it on pinterest and it was literally i was i don't even think i was using the search term wedding dress i don't i don't know i don't think i was searching 18th century tartan it was just some don't remember but it appeared and it was like I, I kind of looked at it and I think I initially kind of thought was, whoa, somebody's made a funny copy of something they think is 18th century. And then I looked at it and said, oh, it's, oh, that's an actual dress in the Inverness Museum. It's real. It's, I mean, and it, they know who owned it. They know who wore it. They know who owns it now. It was just like this long unbroken trail. It's like, you can't look at that and and have any, it just overturned everything that I kind of thought I knew, like you said about 
purple, you know, you just, who thought, who knew? Um, so it was kind of, that was what grabbed me. And then I had an acquaintance through a Facebook social, um, the 18th century sign group at the time, who we were chatting about this because she had an interest in the textile. And she said, well, I live in Scotland. Well, how about next time you come up to Scotland, we'll go see it. And I said, I'm getting married in Scotland in May next year. And she's okay, great. Um, so we did. And the museum, to save them a little bit of, you know, it's more convenient for them, but they said, well, why don't you guys come on the same day that the owner of the dress will be here and we will just focus on the dress that day, which meant it could come out of its display case and we could touch it. And, you know, carefully and super, you know, super, I mean, we all, it, we were very excited and we were very excited. And, but I had no thought at that point of like studying it with a view to making it. I was just enthralled with seeing my first extant garment and it was red tartan. <laughs> and then, I mean, between that and, and actually then creating a project that would involve a replica, you know, a, a lot of, you know, headspace has you know stuff has to happen and you know meanwhile all sorts of things change careers change jobs i mean change jobs moved house got married all these things happening so there was a little bit of a gap before i could kind of pick up anything and go with it well but anyway, so that that brings up that brings up the next point yeah. which is you live in the uk you live yeah in england and scotland is a train right away the other end of the country though. It is. And, it, and, country, and and travel here is not as fast per 100 miles covered as it is in the US. In the US, you can jump in a car and drive across country three and a half thousand miles in three days. I have family members who have done it. Mm -hmm. my, all of my older brothers and sisters when they were younger, at one point or another, would jump in a car and do that. Um, here, here to travel to, Inverness is what 400 miles oh I'd need to look it up <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> I, I, it could be way off that could be way off but it's certainly not three and a half thousand miles and yet it's a 12-hour journey yeah um which is you know looking at it in that context it's just travel covering covering ground is much slower whether you're doing yes. it with public transport or by car you don't get on a motorway that has no interchanges, no junctions, no on ramps, off ramps, um, anything, you know, anything like that. You just don't get in a car and drive 60, 75 miles per hour till you get there. Things, it's just a lot slower here in, in that way. So it was the other end of the country. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. So for me, for you, this, this, gown, the, the extant gown at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Los Angeles is where I grew up. Um, but when I first sort of got it in my head that I wanted to see it and potentially replicate it, by the time I got to that point where I was like, I could do this. Mm. Now, how do I do it? Um, I was planning to be in LA in February of 2017, was it 17 or 18? Yeah, the timeline I need to, I need to refresh my brain, but um, I was gonna be in LA in February. And I thought, you know, maybe that would be a time, I was living in Washington state at the time. So LA is, you know, a three, four hour plane trip. Um, but, you know, so I said, oh, maybe I can make an appointment to visit the museum and see the gown in person and, you know, to a view of potentially looking at it up close or, you know, whatever they might be willing to do. And so I, you know, the next, the next thing we actually have is what was the first thing you did in order mm. to, you know, mm. get to see it or get to handle it or get to look mm. at it. So I called. I called just the main number for the, you know, LA County Museum of Art. <laughs> you know, I'm going to make a point here. It can start with that, with so little information. Yeah. You don't have to somehow find, know from the beginning, the name and 
dress size of the person you need to speak to. <laughs> it starts with general inquiries. Yeah. It starts with picking. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I called the main number that's on the website and, you know, some very nice person at the front desk, you know, my, my question was a little bit nebulous. It was sort of, I'm interested in seeing a gown that is on the website. It says it's not currently on exhibit. Yeah. Um, is that possible? And the, you know, after a series of rerouting of the call and, you know, I, I did finally get to somebody in the textile and um, costume department mm -hmm. and they were very lovely. They were very nice. They, they were delighted to be asked. Um, unfortunately, the museum was being completely renovated and a new wing being added. And so a bunch of stuff was off site. Yeah. There was not going to be a, you know, a way to provide access to the gown. Um, things were, you know, being moved around. It was, it was not, <laughs> it was not a good time. And this happens. And there are so many museums with significant dress collections in the last few years have, you know, closed for up to a year at a time for complete renovations and refitting. And when that stuff goes off to more remote storage, and that means they've got no place to bring it to you to set up a room for you to look at it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So that and, was and, bad luck on timing. Yeah. So, and I thought, well, you know, that's that. Mm -hmm. um, the person I spoke to was great. You know, they were very apologetic and, you know, wish they could have helped more. Um, and then I posted to one of the Facebook um, 18th century groups, I can't remember which one, saying, oh, well, I tried. <laughs> and, and someone commented, maybe you can ask them if they have more pictures. Maybe you can ask them if they, you know, can provide a little more information than mm -hmm. what's in the book, than mm -hmm. <clears throat> what's on the museum website. Mm -hmm. So I called again. Um, I got back in touch with the same person and she said, you know what? We do actually have one archival photograph of when, you know, either the gown was being packed or unpacked or something yeah. and someone took a picture of it all laid out yeah. because as it had been mounted for museum display and for the book, there were details that you couldn't see. Yes. Because obviously you can't zoom in on the pictures on the book. The museum, you can only, you know, the museum website, you can only get the views that they've taken. And there were things that I couldn't see. And so she sent me the archival photo that she had with a little bit more description. So that gave me some ideas about, you know, how certain things looked. And we continued to correspond a little bit. If I had a question about something, she was like, oh, I can ask the person who has handled it, you know. So it, right. it, it we were able to strike up a rapport. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. Um, and I've had that experience with other gowns, other projects. Um, in my case, Inverness, the actual curators, they were the one kind of in charge of that particular collection. And then her boss, who's the overall curator for all the collections and dress his, in her case, um, in Jeanette, Jeanette's case, she's not a specialist in dress or textiles or 18th century. Um, but Carrie, who, uh, was the caretaker and curator for all of the the dress and, and well basically it's the Jacobite anything to do that might have anything to do with the history of Jacobitism and that it kind of encompasses tartan and this is the only um, wool tartan gown that they have in their collection they have I believe it is just one other tartan gown but it's silk and it's early Victorian the early velvet Victorian. right the, it's no, the velvet gown is in another collection. Um, oh. No, the, the the Isabella dress is on display, shares its case with a red tartan silk. It's either late 1830s or early 1840s. Oh, yes, I know the way It's just, I don't know why it doesn't get more attention because it is absolutely beautiful. And you see that one and it's got this tiny, tiny little waist and that's what people kind of remark on. Was that a child who wore that? Anyway, that's no. beside the point. <laughs> But the curators were just so helpful. I mean, this they couldn't help with things like how is this gown actually constructed, you know, cut and constructed, uh, you know, anything about stitches or seam placements or how the lining was put in. It was not, it wasn't, it wasn't a situation with their amount of knowledge and what they had. Hello, Neve. <laughs> 
um, they wouldn't be able to answer helpful questions in that way, but they were more than happy to arrange appointments. So it was kind of a case of once this looked like this project was going to take off, then it was, yeah, actually scheduling and booking flights. And I must admit, because of travel time, and then when it became clear that the actual building of the dress was going to happen in another site, not in Inverness, um, then the only way to manage this was to fly. And so I was flying back and forth. I flew, um, goodness, I flew up there in January, in February, and then again in April, um, before the actual build of the, the dress happened in June. Um, but they, I mean, they were so accommodating and it was similar too with the owner because the original dress is not owned by the museum. So any anything to do with access in ways that might affect the dress, like handling, had to be cleared with the owner, who again, was really enthusiastic about anyone researching and studying this dress, her, you know, her family's dress, because they didn't know much about it and none of them sew. So even the most basic things like asking, does it have a waist seam? And what stitch was used to attach the skirts to the bodice? There wasn't anyone, a modern sewist in the family to help with those sorts of things. And likewise, the curators in the museum. So it really, it did require hands-on. There was one um, kind of report, a two-page report that had been written by a previous curator who, again, her specialty was not dress history, much less cut and construction and she didn't know any of the kind of dress history terms so her descriptions trying to use plain english language to describe the features of the dress are really wacky <laughs> you're going oh <laughs> yeah anyway and it's that was that was a few decades ago that was written because uh, the dress has been with inverness since the mid 1980s i think mm -hmm. anyway so yeah so that was that was some of the issues we've talked about that was kind of on our outline here about main yeah and so for me you know not being able to even see the dress in person not being able main to make an appointment that yeah i mean that was yeah. sort of my biggest obstacle so you know i turned to internet searches to see if i could find more pictures of it closer up pictures of it that that had been you know, made whether they were on someone's blog or if they were, you yeah. know, um, yeah. and there was, there was another, there was a series of pictures of, of a different mounting that actually Useful. helped me, yeah, yes. that actually helped me, you know, kind of determine um, some sort of, not, not, necess not necessarily construction, but how the shape is style out. and silhouette. Yeah. yeah, gen yeah. Um, and you one can kind picture, of reverse engineer on the basis of some of yeah. that stuff. And yeah. one picture in particular, I'm gonna give a shout out to um Catherine Karen Craig, who yes. took a picture when she did see it in LA that showed where the where the you know the museum's pictures, the book pictures didn't show the back seams in the shoulders, but her mm -hmm. picture it. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, shoulder construction. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to we're going to we're going to shout out her blog and social media. She's Koshka the cat. Yes. Anyone who follows historical costuming for just about any time period has probably run across her social media and her blog cuz she's amazing and she's so modest. She doesn't like attention. But my goodness, Koshka the cat. That's Catherine. Yes. She's absolutely amazing. Um but yeah, it's things like shoulder seams and the and the fitting of that. It turned out to be really unusual on the Isabella yeah. dress. And there's no way that we would have known that without it was covered up by yeah. a fichu. It was covered That's... up and and the the picture she took, the light somehow worked so that you could see through the fichu where you couldn't. So the fichu was sheer enough. Yeah. Sheer enough, yeah. Brilliant. So that was crucial. Yeah, I, so fellow, fellow um, people, you know, people in the costume communities, the people that, I, I mean, it's amazing how the internet has made this possible to talk yes. with fellow enthusiasts and people who sew and study and work things out and who are fascinated with the same things. And we'll take the pictures. And we'll go, <laughs> and we'll go visit whatever, a museum exhibition they've got access to that we're not all just looking at strictly at museum photos but we can talk with people who have seen it through glass yeah but taken i mean my current gown project there's been a few pictures taken by martha vitalia nostalgia and 
Cindy at Red Threaded that were like, oh, I wouldn't have known that for museum photos. That's my current project. Right. But that kind of thing, the fellow costuming, the costuming community is the bloodline, the, 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 I don't know, it's just essential now. And I was, but I was going to ask you, um, did you find that researching or having a look at other gowns of the same, that were contemporary, other 1780s gowns, did that help you decipher and and deduct a certain amount of deduction that has to happen when you're working just from photos. Did that help or were there yes. anything that was really relevant? Yes and no. I would say the thing that helped the most in determining how I was going to construct it was not, I, I can't possibly make an exact replica because I haven't seen it. I haven't yeah. been able to examine how it was put together. And honestly, I'm not entirely sure that I would be able at this point in my sewing journey to look at an extant and be able to identify all of the stitches, all of the steps in the particular order. Yeah. The thing that really gave me the confidence to do it um, was having made an earlier style gown from the Larkin and Smith pattern, which is really, you know, they call it a workshop in an envelope. Yeah. Really I mean, it gives it you a grounding, gives you foundation. Yeah. But I mean, you miss stitches. Yeah. Yeah. The stitches, the order of operations, mm. you know, how the lining works and how the stitches work together yeah. to build the gown. I used a lot of what I learned from doing that gown yeah. in this one. And I mean, gosh, the, the costuming community, um, I, I did a, a post and I'm, I'm going to repost it, um, just listing everybody who's held. I remember and, that. Yes. I mean, so much support and so much guidance and so much, you know, what do I do with this fiddly little yeah. bit here? And, you know, yeah. just everybody, you know, being so generous with their knowledge and expertise and, you know, putting all of that together. The other thing that, that was really interesting about this gown is that it's a little hard to see on the camera here, but it has. The zone, what we, what we modern day call a zone front. It's yeah, yeah, it's sort of a zone front and the original, the stripes match, you know, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's tough. Yeah. No pressure. So, right. <laughs> So it's, you know, the idea was that this might have been modified from a prior style and the, the zone front was to cover some, you know, armhole, arm side. I mean, there was, that, there was a yeah. theory that that had been the case with this gown because it's very similar to a gown that's held at the Met, the pink. The um, pink and white stripe. The pink and white stripe gown. Yeah. The, there's been a lot of scholarship on what that gown looked like when it first came to the museum, it had mm. been remade, it had been retrimmed, it had been, you know, sort of, and they were studying what modifications had been made to it to get it to its, you know, more recent so state that they right. kind of had to like undo some stuff to get it to where, because there was a point where the alterations couldn't be fully restored. It had been... Right. I'm so, aware of similar projects and there's yeah. a certain, right, we just can't go any further. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. in this case, I was really just replicating what I could see. Because yeah, the end and, result. You know, I can't, I can't take the, you know, look at the original gown and see what it first looked like if it in yeah. fact was a modified gown. Yeah. And try to do because with the Isabella gown, you could do that. You could sort of say, okay, the sleeves were done this way. There was an error there. You know, so you kind of had to replicate as we had as we to went. we had to learn as we went we could see what the end result was and we could tell because there was no sign of any there's a little little pulse in the fabric that result from previous stitching there was no sign of it ever having been altered mm -hmm. that this was unmolested original construction um yes it's got it's not original condition the fabric has aged a certain way and there is some moth damage um but the actual construction, the way the lining went, it hadn't been altered to fit anybody else. There had been no shifting movement of shoulder seams, um, of side bodice seams, so no adjustments that way. And given how many people are known to have worn this dress after the original, after Isabella did her descendants, um, not just descendants, but people that her descendants married. So there were people with no blood relationship to Isabella who wore her wedding dress uh through 
through time. And then there was a huge chunk of time, time that it appears to have been basically in a trunk, undisturbed, which meant it was out of the light. And that's where it, you know, met a few friendly moths. But um, yeah, so that unaltered helped. Um, what we found that we were puzzled by things that we hadn't seen in other extants. And I say we, as in collectively the team, that amongst us, amongst us, some of us have seen a lot more extants than others. And there's a few, a few that were a few in our team who had not personally studied 18th century extants themselves. So we were all benefiting, pooling our knowledge and asking questions. Well, what about this? And some say, oh, I've seen that in something else. And there were things about the original dress that we, none of us had seen before and it wasn't until, and that, that was a bit of a factor in, well, there's a whole nother sideline as to how this project became not about replicating an original gown, but doing being a demonstration of the process. You know, this wasn't about me making a replica for myself to wear. This was a, well, hang on, this is pretty cool that mantua making as a skill was alive and well in the Scottish Highlands. Who knew? Huh. You know, one of those, it's one of those still black holes that please we're we're working on scholarship for is the actual garment making trade in the Highlands. But in exploring that and realizing actually we're we're definitely seeing contemporary modern ma ma mantra making um, techniques coupled with techniques that were much older, and we didn't know why there was this fusion or hybrid, and the only way that came to light was to think okay let's start at the beginning and try doing it and because we were structuring the process with eight people converging in edinburgh for one week and building a dress over the course of a weekend as a public event with a live audience people coming in and watching and taking photos and asking questions and constant you know interpretation through the entire thing that there will be someone on the team rotating talking about not just what we were doing, but what the situation was at the time about the uh, what we knew of the garment making industry and the linen and wool industries and trade and dyes and everything that we know to date, which there's still so much, I mean, this is just such a rich, rich, rich field for further research on so many different levels. There's no way that one person can try to address all of it. It's just everybody choosing, you know, what's your little bit of the pie that you'd like to research this little thing and hopefully everyone collaborative collaboratively can can add to the general knowledge and understanding of fashion in a quite remote period or, or an area that people think of as very remote that was much more interconnected with the greater world than we tend to think but anyway that was once i realized that we we're dealing with something here that was unique a unique survivor there's nothing there's no other gown like it on a whole bunch of different levels and then it became a well can we show how there's so many people who don't know how these gowns were made? And we have an example here of one from the Scottish Highlands, from a non-elite woman. We're talking, she was not the daughter of a lord or a landowner. She was, um, to be honest, the more I learn in research, calling it class isn't, our perception of class doesn't map on to the way society was structured then. I think class is a, is a little bit of a misfit. It's an ill-fitting garment to try to shoehorn people into. But so somewhat of her level of social standing and also the level to the degree of apparently, you know, her interaction with world's wider society and who she knew and her connections and um, economic situation and, you know, size of her family, her education. Um, you know, we knew that she was not elite. Both of her parents were illit um, illiterate, could not read or write. Um, we do not know about Isabel herself, but there are so many different factors here. We thought we can shine a light and reach as many people. We can educate more people by doing this as a live demonstration and knowing that the way this gown was made was on Isabella's body. So that meant finding somebody that we could build dress on her body. So that was a whole different project than yours. And yeah, there I was mean, no way I could have done that on my own or even with just one other person. And so recruiting, enlisting, begging, <laughs> making a case, basically it was a business pitch to everyone involved to say, this is what I'd like to do. And this is how I intend to do it. And this is why I think it's logical, makes sense, is funded, um, that we can 
marshal the right access the right resources and that we can pull this all together we can make this work and this is what i would like to be able to present to the public this is uh the end goal being educational that was, i'm really really moving on to the next point here and i'll talk about yeah. scope of the project and goals yeah. yes. but um where was i going with this <laughs> no i mean the idea being you know what what was the what was your you know, we we kind of got but it changed just, but yeah. i mean like you i mean i and it's one of those things that percolates it percolates for a while i mean sometimes you spend yeah. months i mean i think in some cases some people have dream dresses and dream projects that percolate that just kind of uh marinate <laughs> marinate percolate what we're talking coffee and <laughs> stew or something yeah food <laughs> But, oh, okay. but, but for years, decades, you know, almost a lifetime, for whatever reason, you just kind of put it aside, haven't got whatever. It, but eventually, and sometimes it's taking, you take a first step, ask the right, ask the first question of the first person that you talk to about it, and it can blossom. And then finally, the, you know, it takes a lot of work. None, none, of this, none of this happens by chance, but it is right. almost like the stars align in a, this is the right time and place with the right people that we can do something remarkable. And for you to do what you did, all of that help was more virtual, although you had, yes. you did have real life friends on hand. Yeah. I, I mean, the they, actual work. Yeah. There was, there was a lot, the, the, the pinning, the draping. And I, I, you know, cause that was fitting to you. I was fitting was, to, yes, yeah. I was fitting to the dress form that I had you know, put my stays on yes. and all the foundation garments and everything. Yeah. So the pinning but the and criteria, the, the criteria yeah. is this must fit me. Yeah. yeah. That was, yeah. that was, yeah, that was my goal was that this was something I was remaking, um, in order to be able to wear mm. and, um, mm. and the, um, you know, the scope was, I want to prove to myself that I can do it. You yes. know, it was, it was really, I, given the limitations i had given the limitations of obstacles you know, i wouldn't call them, they weren't your limitations yeah no it, things you had to overcome yeah things that yeah. things that um i couldn't really control um yeah was the you know not being able to see the gown not being able to handle the gown not being able to examine exactly how it was put together can i still produce a you know a a reasonable replica and and in the in the sort of you know in the in the actual making of it looking at things you know looking closely at the pictures i had kind of figuring out how i could using the techniques i knew mm. make mm -hmm. it make it look as close to the original as i possibly could that was my goal that was just mm. you know can i do this can i can i make it look about right knowing what i know not and and i really did try to use you know period techniques that i had learned in order to achieve that you know i yeah. did not do the only machine stitching i did was the ruffles for the tucker oh ruffles, and, yeah you know and the the um arm ruffles because i was in a millinery. <laughs> millinery. <laughs> millinery yeah millinery yeah so um, not 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 the not the actual substance of the gown not the gown uh, itself, but the gown, and and there were other hands who helped stitch it too. In the yeah. you know in the final run up to being able to. Hey, do it. we <laughs> have yes, we have we have uh, in the original Isabella gown. It's got at least two hands, and I haven't had a chance to chase this up, but I understand, and Nicole will probably pitch in and correct me, Sean, but I think Nicole at American Duchess thought that one of them was left-handed, going two different directions, possibly. Yeah, possibly. I'm not too sure. I'm the one. Who, I'm the one who studied and recorded just the hems of the skirt, such a small facet. And I knew that the stitch length and angle of the needle as they plied through. Because I'm a big one for following travel, follow the thread. And I could tell that the angle was being plied differently. And I just thought that's two different people. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking left-handed or right-handed because, to be honest, I haven't got a lot of experience with that. I've since learned and got better at spotting a left-hander <laughs> i have but at the time i just thought that is two hands in this in the hem and given i mean there's while we were spoiled with the the luxury of being able to study it in person still there was never enough time right i think i think we had about an hour and some of it got very kind of <sighs> complicated the first visit in January then let's see the next 
the next one is an about an hour and 20 minutes that Perrin and Flora and Flora's cousin as an extra pair of hands, but, uh, and myself, the four of us in April before the make. And we were filming and Perrin um, with much more experience with studying museum objects of all kinds, um, kind of, which I'm going to share a link to when we get to tips, when we get to tips here, I'm like, where do you go? How do you learn? And how do you, you know, like feel prepared? There's a particular book that's really, really important that anyone interested in, in um, studying an extant, whether you're based purely on photos or um, in person, uh, is just invaluable. And it, the book came out after both of us did our projects. Of course. But it is now, but it is now my checklist for any future project is anyway, but I'll post a link to that. So, um, and my- I'll say what it is because it's unfair. It's unfair not to mention it. It's called The Dress Detective and it's by two dress historians, Alexandra Kim and Ingrid Mida, Mida, M-I-D-A. She's an amazing dress historian. I follow her on um, Instagram. Cool. Um, but it's called The Dress Detective and it is about being a detective and it's about the slow looking. It's almost a it's almost a zen like way of not just looking but seeing and really the british expression clocking what you see <laughs> as in going oh eureka oh seeing the meaning as you go and not just recording a bunch of stuff data measurements colors a bunch of you know notes about textures and jotting down all these notes and then getting home and reading all through it and going oh i don't quite remember that um, oh, I'd like to have another look. Oh, I didn't write that down. And, you know, I'm a little bit unclear about you. And slow looking addresses so much of that and, and good note taking. But anyway, that book, crucial. So one thing, but, yeah. one thing that I, one thing that I forgot to mention was you can, so in, um, in contacting the museum, the, you know, the very first mm -hmm. time, what I had forgotten to say, I did sort of feel like you know what are my bona fides what are my you know <sighs> yeah and and for me i'm not a scholar in i'm not a formal scholar in dress history i wasn't but, either when, you know, I did, and did, when i did this what it's i what not, I said, it's not though, a barrier except in your head what i said was you know i do historical interpreting i portray abigail adams she was in france mm -hmm. in 1785 the mm -hmm. year of this gown I have, I'm interested in it because it's something that she might have seen in her, you know, social media. And, you know, that was my in. And can that you, was. Can you imagine if she had actually ever seen the original? I know. I know. And, and there's no, that's the thing. There's no provenance given. No. As to the owner, the wearer, who it was made for. Paris what, or anywhere else. Yeah. You know, it just says France, 1785. Yeah. And, you know, so who knows? It yeah. might have been. You know, yeah, but I mean, there's, there's, you, you can't rule it out as something of another time and place. We have a right. time and a place that, yeah. So that's an interest. Plus, it's purple. So it was very plus much, you know, those, <laughs> those were my credentials, and yeah. you know, it was, it felt paltry, but the, my interest and my enthusiasm for it were what sort of, you know, got me in the door. And it is. But I'm, and someday, I mean, I've, been, I've you know, stayed in touch as I finished the gown, I sent pictures of it. And she said, can we add these to, yes. you know, our archival, you know, yeah. about this gown? I said, please do. And when, you know, when things are open again, you know, when the museum yeah. you know, is able to open again, I definitely want to ask her, would you be interested in having me bring the gown, display it, talk, yeah. about, my process, talk about my enthusiasm for it, et cetera. So, you know, that is sort of in the back of my mind as a thing to do someday do it when you will do it <laughs> well see I, I had that opportunity just before the coronavirus where i was invited to go to inverness and talk yeah. about the project with the recreated with the recreated brown gown where i could show the audience you know turn it inside out actually they could lift it actually have it laid over their arms and feel how heavy yeah. it is with the original gown right there as yeah. well and when i was uh it was two speakers i was the second second one and afterwards everyone crowded around you know to be fair and i don't blame them they were 
more people crowding around the original yes. than around <laughs> than around a dress that was made in 2019. Right. No matter how similar they looked, a lot of the people in the audience had not been in the same room with able to get up close to an extant, and rightly so. And that is why we made this gown, yes. did this demonstration of how it was made, chose to not do it in Inverness, but to do it in the museum where the original had been moved to, had been put on loan for a period of about, it was, I think it was on display just over five months, but it was with the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh for about nine months in total. It was with them, which meant that was nine months that it was not on display in Inverness, its normal home where you know everyone knew, knew it. Um, that was why that proximity to be able to do it and say, when you go on your lunch break, you know, from take a break from watching us stitching and cutting and swearing and mopping <laughs> our brows, because it was it was about a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. It was over 30 degrees Celsius, and we were working in full glare of sunlight. There was no shades, no way, but we needed the light. It was the most amazing sewing light I've ever operated in. It was amazing, but it was so hot. Everyone was hot. You know, it didn't matter. And you were we all were. dressed. You were all dressed as 18th century dressmakers. We were. I, to be honest, I don't think we were any hotter though than the people are perspiring. <laughs> people in the audience in their shorts and tank tops. I mean, yeah. It, it didn't matter what you're wearing. You're hot. Yeah. Um. But anyway, but we could say, you know, have you gone? Have you gone into the exhibition and seen the original dress? Because that exhibition, you go in the entrance and you've got this little bit of, uh, you know, from display to set the scene, a little bit of interpretive material, and then you round the corner and the first thing you see in the center, not against the wall but in the center glass cage where you can i mean glass case we can walk all the way was his villa dress yeah that's so cool pride of place um in a 360 walk all around it up and down absolutely nothing except glass between you and it from every angle it was really yeah. remarkable and we could say have you seen it if you haven't watch us for an hour and then when we get to a point where we're just where we're not modeling something on georgia our model but when we're actually just sitting around the table stitching go look at the original you know it's here yeah. and that was that was really key and and then to be able to to give another talk you know reach another part of the public in the inverness area people who had not seen us make this yeah. dress in inverness but people who knew the original that they could get up close to the original and yeah. then inspect ours and we could have photos taken of them together now i only have phone snapshots but the museum, I left the recreated dress with them for up to, it was just about three weeks. And they mounted it and put it on display with the original, with interpretive materials that I'd provided and photos from the project. That's so cool. And talking about it. So it was, had a little mini exhibition for three weeks and they had a professional photographer come in and photograph them both. And then corrupt, then lockdown happened and the museum had to close. They couldn't work anymore. And, um, understandably rightfully so the curators you know basically furloughed and i'm not the, i have to believe the museum is open now but i am not going to be chasing them to see yeah. those photos just yet um no. it's too soon too soon and everyone's got other priorities but that was very exciting for that little bit of you finished the dress but that's not the end of it and no. it is that whole project the whole process is part of you now yeah it's part of your history part of your I'm with Kate I, at Willby and Rose and her discussion that I don't like the word journey, but it is, <laughs> it's a process. Yeah. And it is part of your history, your life experience. So, I mean, what do you feel that you've learned from the, your project the most? What's come through for you? Oh, really? Um, just, you know, for myself, my follow through sometimes is, is lacking. I get really excited about a project and, you know, enthusiastic about it and passionate about it. And, and I sort of, sometimes I just kind of lose, you know, motivation or something frustrates me and I put it aside, you know, I'm, and so my project steps in. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, I had a goal. I had the costume college gala. Yeah. And, okay. And I really wanted to wear the gown to the gala. I, people had been sort of, you know, aware of the project. I, I was not on Instagram yet. Mm. Um, and more's the pity because I feel like, you know, it would have, <laughs> have a lot more documentation if you'd been on Instagram. <laughs> I mean, it's all, it's all, it's all documented on Facebook, but, um, 
but the you know the i had i had such a a a, a sense of community as i was making it that I knew those people were really rooting for it and really, it's you know, support you had that support. Yeah and, yeah. and so being able to say, you know, it's done. We did it. I made it. It's ready. Yeah. Um, was, you know, that to me was, you know, this is a project that, it, and there's still, you know, there's still probably a few things I could do to kind of really, you know, have it feel, um, finished, but it's, you know, it was, it was wearable for gala. It was it was ready to be debuted. You know, <laughs> we were presenting we were presenting this to an audience five o'clock on Sunday with still a lot of pins of stuff in the back, yeah. it, and we were then needing to be exiting and cleared up all of our stuff <laughs> by a certain time that evening, and we were frantically still. And there were a few things that I later, after I got home and decompressed, it yeah. took a couple of months actually to kind of come back to it. Um, there were a few things that the whole team had said. There's a couple of things that just kind of need to be tidied up just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So those got done. Those did get but done. Yeah, I mean that was that was really you know that was my my proudest thing about it was that it you know it got finished and I had like I said I had huge amounts of help with you know just getting those final little fiddly details done. You know, my mom was stitching the hem until God, three in the morning or something. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that, that just, you know, yeah. it, it did happen, but it was not just me, but it was the, it, it was, it was at a point where, you know, it needed these last few things done and yeah. it was, it was feasible. It was doable. Well, um, we've got the, we've got the video and the footage and everything, which we're going to share here to prove it, that you yeah. were, you were, you were the height of Parisian fashion. <laughs> um in 1785 which actually is really remarkable but you know it's similar for me in that the the take the main takeaway was wow we did it as a team with <sighs> oddly enough in a weird sort of way i sense the world was watching and everyone was rooting for us yeah um the, i mean there were hiccups and there were all sorts of logistical issues and there were you know <laughs> things that came up that, you know, with a museum, uh, National Museum of Scotland had never hosted, never, you know, served as the venue host for an event like this before. And they didn't really believe our assertions that people would come to see this, that this yeah. would be interesting, that that we could put bums on seats, as they said. That people, <laughs> right. And it was each day it would trickle, it'll be a little bit slow. Then we had a handful of people and I'm, I'm, um, I'm, don't think I'm underestimating to say there were at least six who came to Edinburgh, stayed in Edinburgh, they stayed in hotels, they ate the food, they spent their tourist dollars on Edinburgh for us. Yeah. That in some cases, they didn't even really see the exhibition in full. They came for us and they were there when the door opened, they got their seats and they were with us 10 to five, two days in a row. Wow. Beginning to end. And that, is incredibly humbling. It's yeah. incredibly hum that that it's the commitment. It's not just the interest, and then people don't act on it. And people, but they you know, keep and that people say, "Oh, I'd love to see that." And the number of people who just, "Oh, I'd love to see that. I wish I'd seen it." Oh, you know, I knew about that, but I had something else. And the people who flew. I mean, one of those four, five, or six people, at least three of them flew. They had airfare, hotel, food mm -hmm. expenses, everything, and they gave up their weekends at home with their families, with all the other things they could have done at the height of the summer, in the best weather. <laughs> they were in a hot, hot room in a museum yeah. to watch eight people make a dress. Um, <laughs> and uh, and and yeah, but. It's it's and it's the community, it's the love and it's yeah. the community and the interest and the relationships forged to with us, you know, as our team of eight. Yeah. It's like a little bit of a trial by fire. We had not all eight of us worked together before. We'd had <laughs> we'd had sort of a master class that week. We did a lot of crash swatting, you know, studying, you know, like revising for an exam, all of that. But the crucible was two days in and crucible give me how hot it was yeah I mean, we cannot under we cannot understate how hot it was um and how heavy 
not very well. Oh, but this, this brings us to the point of, of fabric, of the materials. It. Materials. So um, the materials I'm just going to that... check on timing. We are still recording. It is, we've gone on for a bit. I think it's going to be fine. And to be absolutely honest, given the way a lot of the live panels have gone on COVID this weekend, I'm going to do minimal editing. We are just having a fantastic chat <laughs> and trying to cut it all down and cut stuff out would be more than my sanity is worth. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't try. So um, yeah, materials. I mean, how do you figure out what you need and what, oh man, it's just a story. It's just compromises. <laughs> it's accessibility. It's price. Okay. So you, this yes. fabric did not exist no. that you could find commercially available. I anywhere. looked everywhere. I searched every fabric store online that I could think of. I searched through. And you were the, asking, you were out there asking was, everybody online tips, you know, you weren't just relying on just the places you knew you were. No, I searched it out there. I searched the New York fashion district. I searched the LA fashion district. I <laughs> looked everywhere for purple and white striped silk fabric that was not sheer that was not you know yeah. wide stripes it's a slubby and yeah. not slubby yeah. yeah particular width of stripe and particular oh. weave it didn't exist no. and eventually um so you know it was like okay i don't want to i don't if i don't have to i don't want to compromise on the fabric because the the fabric is the is the statement of this piece you know, the shape is a fairly standard, you know, 1785 zone front gown. Yeah. It's not revolutionary in any way other yeah. than this dramatic purple and white vibrant stripe. Yeah. So, um, you know, to make the gown, I needed the fabric. And I found, I searched and searched and searched Etsy, eBay, you know, everything I could think of. I found an Etsy seller who sold candy stripe silk but not in purple. She had blue, green, pink, mm. you know, every color but purple. So I messaged her and I said, you know, if you in your, you know, fabric search come across a purple and white stripe, please let me know. I would happily, you know, purchase that from you. She says, well, and she's in, she's in Australia. Oh, right. She says, well, I'm going on a shopping trip to China soon. I'll keep my eyes peeled, et cetera, et cetera. So eventually she says, you know what? I'll work with my weaver. We can do a custom, you know, we can do a custom weave. Um, they are in Cambodia. I'm in Australia. I'm happy to, you know, facilitate this, yeah. um, to, you know, pass along the payment, however that might work for you. There's a minimum order of 50 meters. Yeah. Okay. Anytime you do a custom order, yeah, of fabric, yeah, it's a minimum yeah. order. It's not worth their while, and warp right. setup takes so long. Once the warp is set up, it almost makes no difference how much they weave, yeah. but they have to make it worth their while. So, so, so for my little project, 50. I certainly did fifty yards, but yards again, meters, meters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, but this is where the community came in because you know I posted, I'm gonna order fabric yeah. for the project. Yeah. Is there, are there enough people who would also take 10 meters of this fabric for whatever projects you yeah. have in mind? And there were. So, you know, I yeah. basically, you know, facilitated getting money from them. Yeah. And then at, at, at one point, the, the Etsy seller had said, you know, if you're sending me money and I'm sending it to Cambodia, there's too much loss in the transfer. Cons yes. Yeah. So, you know, I will, I will, I will accept a finder's fee essentially, you know, and you pay the weaver. Yeah. I think right. it's best if you handle, you know, and I did like right. Western union or something. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. all told, with a 50 meter order, including shipping, and she they cut it into um, 10 meter. Right. You know, so you had five five people each getting 10 meters. Yes. So you only needed 10 meters. Yes. Yeah. And all told, it came out with shipping to $22 a yard a meter. <gasps> wow. Which for a custom order, that's not much different than any of the other sellers I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it, you can't actually beat that in some of the bargain places like yeah. fabric, uh, Fashion Fabrics Club and the yeah. incredible deals they sometimes do on silk. Wow. So all wow. told, 
you know, this international project all of a sudden truly um, international turned out to be, you know, and, and again, it, it would not have been possible without having mm -hmm. a community to go to and say, yeah, you know, I'm doing this wacky thing. <laughs> <laughs> Who else wants in? Yeah. You know, so, um, price is important. Um, is, sorry, I don't want to continue because I, 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 the, the fabric so, and pricing yeah, so is, the, a, is an interesting thing. So the fabric was the main thing. Now, it's not the same weave as okay most taffetas you would find it's a looser weave and i have mm -hmm. i did have that to contend with in the making of it i couldn't treat it the same way and i couldn't yeah. necessarily even really sew it the same way as the taffeta i had worked with for the 1760s ish gown i made wow. before this one yeah i had to sew it and I found this out the hard way with the sleeves. Yeah. I couldn't just leave a raw edge no. and let it no. sit and no. wait to work on it. Yeah. Um, so there were some issues that I came up with that. But the overall look is, you know, the final result. It's not, it's not, it depends on the light. The, you yeah. know, the, the final result of the purple is a little bit of a duller, you know, overall aspect than the original. But there was never going to be the exact same fabric. Yeah. So, you know, I have the, the satisfaction of knowing that I did, you know, the but best anyone, I could. But anyone could. You made all the right inquiries and you found, <laughs> you found a weaver who could do it. Um, I, yeah. tend, I tend to do this with projects though. I go on, I go on Fabric Wild Goose Chases and it takes, you know, I, it's got to be exactly right. For my my aesthetic when it comes to if I'm replicating something that is an extant or in, is is in a portrait, mm. you know, it's really important to me to be able to replicate it as closely as possible. And I will I will wait. You know, I'll <laughs> I'll wait until the right thing comes along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think everyone's got to make that decision for themselves whether yeah. there's something about the project and the what they want to accomplish with it that. Um, as close a as close a copy of the fabric or the textile is crucial, yeah. or whether that actually is more open ended, and you know, there's all sorts of real life issues. You know, time to, it takes to get stuff made or to find it, and price price is yeah. price is for most of us the most important kind of limiting factor in yeah. what our options are to explore. How close can we get? But there are some projects, some museums, some gowns, that what you really want is, yeah, you, you're calling it a replica, but perhaps your dream is something quite different. With the Isabella dress, for a lot of people, the dream was to have a tartan gown in their clan tartan. Now, the original tartan set, this design, this layout, it predates the organization of tartan designs into family affiliated groupings. It predates the register for tartans. Yeah. Um, it comes from a time where everyone who had a, had a, there was a lot of industrial production of tartan uh, that was being made that basically on spec to be sold wholesale and retail. So the design house or the mill would make those decisions. We're going to, you know, make, you know, how many ever, I think L was the measurement the, the mm -hmm. unit of measure, then we're just going to make a whole bunch of it and we're going to market it and we are, we're sure we'll, there'll be a sufficient demand that it's attractive enough that it will all sell. And then there were small weaves that were commissioned and that's what Isabella's dress obviously was, was what uh, Tartan historian Peter McDonald, I think refers to as a rural McDonald, Peter McDonald, refers to as a rural weave, as in it's not industrial for a as a commercial enterprise it would have been of course commissioned and paid for by someone who was skilled at weaving and again that was a skilled trade and if there was a weaver in your village that's what they did full time and was their economic contribution and was what enabled them to then barter and buy and earn cash as their living they made their living out of that you know very sophisticated skill that took a lot of time to learn we don't know who commissioned or who designed whether whoever wanted that particular length of fabric to be made said i want it mostly red or i want a certain arrangement or whether there was a certain latitude that the weaver took in terms of what they could have available in the the quantity of worsted spun yarns 
that had been dyed certain colors and the quantities they had of each. We don't know any of those factors that went into yeah. the Isabella dress, but because it is quite distinctive and being the only survivor, I felt that we needed something as closely as possible. Also, my very first encounter with the original dress, I was so stunned at how different a worsted spun uh, heavy wool. You know, we're, we're talking kind of 20 ounce weight in modern term, in modern sewers, when we're looking, shopping around for wool, and we're kind of looking at weight ounces, that's usually how they're described. And I had just kind of assumed, I had not really thought about worsted spun yarns versus woolen spun yarns, which come from whether the fleece you know, going back a step, you know, was the fleece combed or was it carded? Does it come from a crinkly coated fleece sheep breed of sheep versus a long lustrous fiber breed of sheep? All of those things that feed into it, it all produces a very different textile. And that was my first encounter with hard tartan, which is yeah. what historically 18th century, that's, you know, it shifted. It did change to woolens. It did change to the textile completely went through revolution and change and transitions into the 19th century, but hard tartan, and it was so distinctive, I thought I've got to get as close as I can get. And I am not kidding, that was the hardest part of the project. All the mm -hmm. inquiries, all the leads that dried up and came to nothing and people didn't respond. And I found the original breed of sheep now extinct. Yeah. Then finding, okay, well, what's an alternative appropriate characteristic fleece breed of sheep that is you know that is producing that you can get the wool commercially okay probably blue face lester then finding blue face lester that was creamy colored that could be dyed a lot of blue lester the purpose is that that yarn is uh, sorry that the fleece is developed as yarn for uh, for all sorts of purposes the color and the dyeing ability is not crucial <laughs> and so everywhere I was talking to you, says, well, we can get you brown or black. Yeah. Can't dye it. I, it, it was then it was, OK, well, if I can get the fleece and I kind of had a lead. And I was talking with a couple of people, a couple of different um, uh, spinner spinning. Um, I want to say farms, but anyway, a couple of enterprises in Shetland about Shetland wool. Um, Shetland fleece is not a lustrous long fiber fleece, but it's often it's 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 fairly readable there is a commercial uh demand for it to be worsted spun so i talked with two enterprises that they're both of them you know recommended to me one was like we can't help you very regretful friendly helpful but regretful sorry we can't do that for you the other place was just rude what what you no you know it's like oh you know stop interrupting my day kind of it, it was I'm not going to say which is which because as it happens, they both have incredibly similar names. <laughs> I don't know if they're related. I don't know if there's any <laughs> common backstory, anything oh, like that. Goodness. But one was friendly, but sorry, we can't help you. And the other one was don't want to know. So then it was like, okay, I I approach spinning guilds. Do you mm -hmm. have any elderly members with experience in worsted spinning? And it was basically lack of response because of the sheer amount. You know, I needed to get enough worsted spun yarn to be woven into 26 inch loom width on a loom. And I needed 20 meters of it. And 20 meters, I was being incredibly cautious. We only needed about 10 for the dress, but I was terrified something would go wrong. And that, I mean, that is also why, it was and, and it the, did, and it did. I mean, it's yeah. like every stage of this, it was like, you get knocked back. And yeah. so that's not possible. What are my alternatives? So then I was of, using, I was using fabric that was wide. That was, I mean, 50, yeah. 59, 60 inches wide. Yeah. So, you know, so you have, do you have you, no selvages then, so, which affects yeah. construction. Yeah. 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 So, but then, you know, using, using, you know, historical dress lengths, and widths, widths, loom widths. Um, loom widths is, you know, that wasn't a challenge. <laughs> no, no. And I think if you're dealing, if you're dealing with a, a weaver who is used to serving a modern day market, negotiating with them, even bringing up the question of loom widths, may just not be. It just may, it might be a pointless conversation, and only, um, not necessarily confuse them, but it may kind of give them a flavor of they're not going to make you happy and you're not going to be happy with yeah. what you provide so you just kind of don't want to go there when it became clear that i could find someone to do a bespoke weave who had the kind of looms 
that we could at least specify the width and then thread count. And that weaver had already taken a thread count, had examined the, had, she'd examined the aerosate portion. So she wasn't up, up um, examining the dress, but the, the kind of shawl like, which was cut, made, obviously made from the same length. This was made and woven the same time as the fabric that went into the dress. Mm -hmm. So it's all the same length of fabric that's just been cut. Um, so once we had that, we think, okay, we, we need it as close as possible. Well, the loom that she had was not exactly the same as an 18th century loom. And the yarns that eventually she was able to source through her contacts and her suppliers was not exactly the same. It's called a gauge or a weight, but it was not exactly the same. We ended up with the first weave coming out too narrow mm. um, by about 10%. It was about 23 inches wide. And because we already knew that Georgia, our model that we'd be fitting a dress to, was a little bit larger in size than what we knew Isabella was from mm -hmm. her dress. I mean, that's like a body, you know, like that tells you everything about an original body is to look right. at the clothes that were made bespoke, fitted to them. So we, I just I said, we need to reweave. Or look, I basically I threw myself basically just like Claire, a weaver. Claire, I can't use this. She says, We're on it. We're we're work set up today. We're anyway. So yeah, and that was another delay. I was quite panicked. So yeah. there's all these little things that you're thinking, you inform yourself, make an informed decision, you make a compromise. And I kind of feel like we are getting to the point where we kind of need to do a bullet point list of well things so for th things for our friends who are watching this to be. I, I think some of it is decision making in terms of what you want and yeah. what is possible for you, what you can do. And I also don't want people to think that, you know, <laughs> this, the way we've described getting the fabrics for these yeah. very different gowns might sound daunting. And, you know, yeah. I think both of us, you know, both of us had particular, you know, if you're going to display the gown alongside its extent, yes, you want it to look as close to the original as possible. You kind of want, you want to be proud. Let's, let's, there's no getting yeah. around it. You want to be proud of your work. And I mean, yeah. mine, mine may or may not end up, you know. You will be time. proud of your work. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, for me, that's, that was my priority. And that was yeah. my willingness to, you know, do that legwork and do that yeah. research. And, and that doesn't have to be the case. You don't, no. you know, you shouldn't feel like oh my gosh it's got to be exact or it's perfect there's no point bothering no yeah. this is absolutely true because for me the 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 ultimate goal was education and to serve that purpose we could have used any fabric truly we could have demonstrated but then on the other hand we could have been to do a demonstration of making a gown the period with using period techniques and and the way it was done by mantua makers then we could have been replicating any gown or no gown. It could have been a generic gown. We could have done a demonstration, but because I wanted to be specific, show people that this this was a Scottish Highlands gown that was not upper class. This was not a yeah. rich woman's gown. This is a surviving normal person like you and me. You know, mm -hmm. a normal everyday person just trying to make a living and live their lives in the Scottish Highlands. Yeah, had access to someone who had the skills to make a dress like this for them. And, but I mean, it is and that was yeah. my point, and it could have yeah. been any fabric. But yeah. I think it was that knowledge that because the original dress was already so well known and so well loved, and so so many people wanted to know how it was made, had attempted to make their own clan tartan versions of it. But there were I, there were aspects of the construction that I knew that nobody had had the the you know the sheer good fortune to see in person, and I wanted to share that knowledge as well. And it just became a case of, I wanted this dress to be recognizable. And I, that's, I think, where you have utterly succeeded. It almost, some of the details don't matter, but if your goal is that when somebody looks at your dress, they, they know what dress you were thinking of, yeah. even if it's not a direct copy. Yeah. Because otherwise, I mean, that was, that's what's, that's where it all starts with each well, of us. Well, that's why it that's is, the gown you fall in love with. That <laughs> is the gown you fall in love with. And if you're making something else that is even perhaps even more beautiful or more spectacular or has some incredibly special thing about it, but that's a different gown. Mm -hmm. And I think if you fall in love with a particular gown, you want to end up, you want your end result to be, ah, oh, it's, you know, it's mine. It, this is mine of that 
amazing, remarkable yeah. thing that you saw and that just grabbed you that was your hook and you just couldn't let it go it was not like other gowns you see so many gowns and you just pass by oh that's pretty oh that's pretty oh yeah I'll go back second look yeah oh that's pretty on and on and on you go and you go oh that's you know <laughs> like no more collars we have a winner no more collars yeah yeah so I think kind of wrapping up I mean it is I, I'm gonna my mantra my mantra as a teacher and well it started as a student and as a secretary in a very high pressure job is managing expectations mm. and in the it's it's not just about managing other people's expectations it's about managing your own not being too hard on yourself knowing what is realistic making you know doing enough investigation fact finding to figure out what your options are and then making an informed choice that you're comfortable with and sometimes you make a decision you think i'm going to proceed this way i'm going to make this decision i'm going to do it a certain way and you proceed down that path and you're not quite happy with it and you've got to go back a step or even two steps in that process and go mm, I need to revisit this decision and do something different or um talk to someone else get uh, and, you know someone there, else's viewpoint yeah. I think I need before I can proceed it's always it's a stop step it is often three steps forward two steps back but my point is that it is being comfortable with the decision process make uh, decision making process as you go along at the end yeah. of the day, it's your project. It's your gown or your suit or whatever it is you want to make. It's yours. And you are the only person who has to be happy with it. And I mean, you you had the ability to, you know, really look at the gown stitch by stitch yeah. and see how it was done and, you know, be able to sort of replicate that. And I know and my I, privilege there. I know how privileged. And, that. and and I couldn't do that, but I, you know, I felt equipped to you know, make educated decisions mm. based on the pictures and based on, you know, the knowledge I had of, you know, 18th century dressmaking, which is still, you know, I'm, I'm no expert. You never saw it. No. <laughs> but from what I had done, I felt that the decisions I made in recreating what I saw were sufficient to make me feel that, you know, it's plausible. It, mm -hmm. it is plausible mm -hmm. that it could have been made in the way I chose to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there might be nuances. And of, the more extents you study, the more you yeah. realize they're all different. Yeah. There's more than one way to skin a cat. There's yeah. basic, there's basic approaches and basic things that obviously mantra makers and dressmakers were being, were learning or being taught. There was a certain kind of just a general way of doing things, but the individuality in every gown, even down to stitch choice, it's not everything done the same way. Yeah. which is exactly what you said that's a very good point plausible yeah but can you if asked can i not that we expect to be put on the spot with you know like an, an exam or hostile questioners or something <laughs> no this like, isn't a doctoral but, but can I, yeah yeah we're not defending a doctor but you know can i justify my choices a bit or explain the compromises that i make and because the minute you start talking about the challenges you faced your options that were before you and why you chose to the option that you did, the minute you have a chance to even express a tenth of that to somebody, everyone's on board. The sympathy is like, oh yeah, yeah, I would have done the same in your shoes. Well, and or for, for yeah, there could have been other things that maybe I would have done it differently, but yeah, I totally get why you did what you did. So yeah, for anyone who is, you know, dreaming of this, mm. you know, a gown or an ensemble or any, you know, embroidered silk francaise, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it might be, whatever it is, um, you know, I think that, you know, if you are allowing yourself giving yourself permission to say whatever it is that fabric as it is the way it was made isn't feasible a hundred percent now because mm -hmm. you know the weaves are different the, the show oh, you know whatever it might be there's we'll there's never have the same and that's no why way. you have to be happy with your compromise yeah there's no way to 100 percent in all aspects of remaking a, a museum you know, an extant ensemble or gown, you you have to give yourself permission to allow for those circumstances. Yeah. That there's no way to do it a hundred percent. And where where you're willing to kind of, you know, because you can't get exactly the same fabric, give yourself permission to make those changes to how you would stitch it in order yeah. to protect it from yeah. fraying. You know, whatever and, it might be. Yeah. And give yourself 
full credit, pat on the back, for being a problem solver. I think that is something all the way through that the different things you encounter at different stages is that you will have to be a problem solver, which means being positive and proactive and surviving the little bumps and the discouragements and the knockbacks. And <laughs> at the end of the day, how, whatever you whatever you end up with, even if you're kind of thinking, oh, I could have done better. And I'll tell you, you learn so much during the process that by the time you finish, you know, you almost wish you could start all over again. You could do, you know, you're thinking I can do this better the next time. And you end up with, um, no, I'm not, I am not going to have three Isabella dresses. <laughs> you know, no, but absolutely at each stage that you are able to progress to the next stage, pat on the back, you know, Treat yourself with some, yeah, after high fives all around because you've solved the problem. And this, these projects, they are a series of hurdles. Each one could be the one that stops you if you let it. And if you don't let it beat you, the success, I, I think the, the end result, the, the whole thing, it's, it's that much sweeter, I think, at the end because you're looking back at a whole line of problems that you've solved. Yeah. And we want to see them. Yes. We, want see <laughs> we want to see your success. Coco Bid, Coco Bid next year. I, I think we need to have a showcase or a gala of people who in the intervening year between our talk and next year, it's like, yes, let's have a, uh, you know, these red, you know, Instagram stories, whatever, you know, all the stuff that we're doing this year, I think it's even happening today. We hope it'll be back to real life, you know, Coco in person, but yeah. But, but to be honest, we can widen the conversation with so many yeah. more people doing it virtually. Yes. Yeah. What we can't do is get up close and, you know, yeah. costume college, we would have been in a room where everybody could come and feel Take and, a and even unmount the dress forms for a short period of time to have people. So people could look at the insides yeah. and we could have shared a lot more photos of process, but to be honest, this talk is not about these individual dresses or even 18th century or even women's wear or Western European wear yeah. or, you know, anything that's limited in time, place, culture, any of those, this, this is, this is a universal challenge that yeah. I'm putting out we, there. Yeah. I mean, we really, we really hope it you... is that you want to make, it might not even be textiles. Yeah. I think there's a fair point to be saying that even if it's something you know, that came out of a bog 2000 years, you know, from 2000 years ago, and it's rotted away. Um, I think, I think there are talks from others this weekend about various medieval things or people who do that kind of thing. If you explore their channel, that might not be what they're talking about this weekend, but look a little further elsewhere on their channels and you'll see some just incredible reconstruction work of all sorts of objects, not just clothing. Yeah from all eras and all parts of the globe, from all time periods and cultures. And yeah, there's no limit other than what's in your head. And no, and we want, we want you to feel empowered. I mean, yeah. empowered to, to, you know, not just look at the item yeah. in the museum and dream. Yeah, but then it is dream your dream and then you make it happen and it will yeah. be your unique, unique to you and it will be stamped, everything about it will be stamped with your personality and your goals and your abilities and your community. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It takes a village, I'm not kidding, yep. I'm not kidding. And I think on that note, are we, have we got anything else that is Oh, burning that we, we managed to, to cover it all in yeah. two hours <laughs> yeah i'm i'm a little bit worried now about the editing but um gosh gosh because it just we it's one of the could talk for hours and yes. it would be i am so looking forward to doing this as a premiere where we actually can but anyway i think we do need to say kind of <laughs> bye for now um and you know what because this is all the whole context the way this all happened Coronavirus, I'm going to end with, be safe. Yes. Wash your hands, wear your mask. I can only echo those sentiments. <laughs> Would Abigail have said so had something yes. very pertinent to say? She, she hauled herself and her family and 17 people to Boston to be inoculated against smallpox. Okay. Which watch this space on future vaccines. Personally, I'm quite a cynical person. I'm not that confident there will be an, a completely effective vaccine, but follow the science. Yep. 
that's all we can do really and hope to see you all soon as many of you as possible in the coming weeks months years so long <laughs> bye for now <laughs>